Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. Hi folks and welcome back to Through a Scottish Prism. Uh, it's lovely to be with you again. I hope you and yours are well. It's been a heck of a week again and there's lots to talk about. The Parliament's might be still be shut. But a lot is happening. Um, and let's get on to it without any further ado. Let's bring in the crew. Over there in Edinburgh, we've got our Lloyd. Hi, Roddy. How are you doing? Ah, tickety boo, Lloyd, yourself. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there, up and click Marin, everyone's favourite lawyer. Eva, how are you? Hello, Roddy. Yeah, I've had a really good week and I would like, if it's okay with you, please to start by thanking everybody who's contributed to or shared my crowdfunder for my general election campaign. It's gone really well in the first week, so I'm really delighted. Um, any more shares or support that people can give would be greatly appreciated because obviously I'm determined to win this seat, put Aloe and Grange back on the map and pursue the Independence for Independence campaign with full steam ahead. Here, 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 here. We make sure that we do. Now, folks, you've got a few, couple of pennies here and there. Um, Eva will be back. Okay. There she is. She's back. If you've got a few pennies there, stick it into Eva's hey, fighting fund. We're going to get rid of Mr. Buffon himself. <laughs> and in the Edinburgh Airport bar, it's our traveller, our, our prison gypsy. It's our Phil. How are you? I sound. I do love the bikes. That's me. Totally travelling around the planet, just and I, I believe there's some stories. It's like either the Boswells or the Beaudevilles, uh, which I don't believe. I think we're properly travelling folk. That's what the the Boswells are, King of the Gypsies. If you watch the Peaky Blinders, so happy days, happy to travel, happy to wander, and uh, had a had a riot. Had a, I've had a riot in my first week in Brussels, so I'm back for the weekend to finish packing because I packed a wee bit pished in the last 20 minutes before the taxi came. So 25 shirts, some trousers, one sandal, hardly any shoes. So I'm back for the rest, <laughs> basically. You're an awful man, Mr. Boz. We are awful oh, man. Life, but that's, life. That's what I, well, I, that's like, take his ass, nay knickers. Uh, no, funny enough. I had to buy some. I've got a uh, Belgian underwear on. Uh, well, uh, I'm scared to ask. You, I'm, not, I'm not going. To, I'm not going to ask. No, I'll hear. It's called ta it's called your... talcum powder. Well, there, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I know. Their state's called trigger. <laughs> right, let's get this some serious stuff in here because it's been a serious week, Lloyd. Uh, and down in England, um, uh, the cash review, which is what we'd had some, a wee taster for it, but the full review came out. And it's been quite a uh, quite a thing, and it's, they're suggesting that you know puberty blockers should not be given to kids um, on prescription. They shouldn't be rushed into trans surgery. In fact, they should be waiting to the age of twenty five. It's kind of sensible things, um, and it should be treated as a mental health problem first and foremost. The kind of things that um, the people who have been campaigning have been saying, but the Scottish government is dodging it and refusing to speak in it. I just find it incredible that uh, we have something as monumental as the, the cash review and there's not a single minister out of the 29 Scottish government ministers available to speak on the issues. But I think this is just the, the tip of an unfortunate iceberg. The, uh, the infrastructure that was, that was put in place to deliver the GRRB and indeed the hate crime bill, that whole infestation of the, the third sector, uh, which happened on the ideological basis that uh, men can be women, which now needs to be dismantled. What we're seeing here with the intransigence of the Scottish government is the heels are being dug in because this is a major, this is a major, major event. The deconstruction of everything that has brought us to this point the removal of particular individuals from the civil service, from the third sector, from the Scottish government, from the benches of the Scottish Parliament, where people have to now, given the results of the cash report, now have to stand up and say they were wrong. And I think at the moment we have a bunch of people who do not have the word wrong in their vocabulary. This is going to be a fight, and this is a fight that has to be won. And it is essential 
that the instructions given to schools, the National Health Service, the police service in this country are the, on the, the basis of the, the very opposite of the cash review have to be removed. And all those who are the cheerleaders for this insane concept have to either admit that they were wrong or they have to take the long walk. There's an awful lot of people who have to seriously think about whether or not they are now still employable. And I include in that certainly the Chief Executive of Rape, Rape Crisis Scotland and of Women's Aid Edinburgh. No, I can agree. Here's the thing, even the Neil Gray, um, the, the, the Scottish Cabinet Minister, when asked for comments, oh, no, no, he said, this is all clini clinical decisions, it's not a political decision. <laughs> yeah, that's what they've made it for the last three years. It's destroyed the Yes movement, it's destroyed the SNP, it's got rid of the consensus we had, and that was politics. It wasn't It wasn't doctors that caused that. Yep. Very damaging, very destructive ideology that's become embedded in Scottish political life and in Scottish culture and in Scottish institutions. And you can trace the, the beginnings of it in Scotland back to something which at the time seemed pretty sensible, and it was the campaign for inclusive education. Because if you were not paying attention, you thought that that was about gay children being able to be included and not excluded, when in fact it extended to the trans ideology and brought in the likes of LGBT Youth Scotland, and you found that most local authorities in the country were linking to and taking advice from Stonewall and from the now, thankfully, discredited mermaids. So people like my MP, John Nicholson, were keen to jump on the bandwagon and say things like, protect trans children, when what we should have been doing was making sure that we provided in Scotland what the cash review has suggested very strongly is needed in England, and that is holistic care for children who have any sort of gender issue. But that holistic care should, in terms of CAS, not require affirming children who say they want to change their gender or are a different gender. It should require holistic assessments of children which are done carefully and are evidence-based where prescriptions are not done as the result of a short knee-jerk analysis, particularly because the evidence shows very plainly that substantial numbers of children who claim to be trans are on the autistic spectrum or have suffered from trauma or have other issues which need to be taken into account so that whatever care or attention they get is tailor-made to their individual circumstances and the result for them is a bespoke one. They're not simply stuck on a conveyor belt where one size fits all. The blame, if you like, for their feelings is attributed to transgender issues and they become prescribed puberty blockers. Now, puberty blockers are still available in Scotland. They are still being prescribed, even although, again, a substantial body of evidence indicates that you cannot block puberty to any positive effect for a child. In fact, young girls who use puberty blockers can develop something akin to osteoporosis and serious bone defects. Boys and girls who have puberty blockers in later life are often rendered infertile and there are other more awful consequences <laughs> for these children. Now, that does not come simply as the result of medical decisions. It comes as the result of policy and political moves and political steps and strategies that the SNP and the Greens have been four squared behind for most of the last decade at least. The Equalities Minister is currently Emma Roddick. Before her, it was Christina McKelvey. Both of these women should be making statements this very day dissociating themselves entirely from the ideology that they've promoted thus far. They should be closing down the Sandyford Clinic. They should be banning puberty blockers right this minute. And they should be announcing a Scottish version of the CAS review and properly funding child and adolescent mental health services so that children and teenagers in Scotland do not wait years for assessments and diagnosis but get the holistic care that they need. It's a very easy, very cheap fix to prescribe somebody a life-changing medication and it is utterly and completely wrong because it takes these children down a pathway 
towards surgery, which for almost 100 teenage girls in Scotland has involved them going down across to the NHS to England to have double mastectomies. And many of these young women go on to regret that surgery. There is much worse surgery than that being carried on in the UK, and it is an absolute disgrace. And the reason why the Scottish Government have not made a statement is because they're waiting for lawyers like me to intimate the compensation claims. And when they come, the floodgates will open because the sums of money that will have to be paid out to these children and their families will be mind-blowing. Good. They deserve every penny that's getting taken from them. Phil, um, uh, Eva spoke about it there. They closed down the tavern stop quite some time ago. But up here, they kept the sand effort open. It's still open. Um, will they listen? I mean, even after this, you know, learned doctor's report, are they capable of saying, mm, we've made a mistake, we're sorry? No, it's, it's not going to happen. And we've seen that before. Once they've got this ideologically possessed legislation in place, they rock on with it. It doesn't matter what the initiative is. It's all disruptive. It's all disintegrating the the independence movement. So first, I'd agree with Eva for the many abused under this system. Second, Neil Gray is lying. They create legislation to remove the power from the medically, psychologically qualified individuals to make these decisions and instead enforce their ideological beliefs on the people through the same legislation. Of course, it's political, Neil. It's idiot politics infringing on the well-earned use of discretion on a case-by-case -case basis on suitably qualified professionals to judge whether a vulnerable child is should be subject to treatment on, on a very, very experimental and difficult um, difficult course of medication. So, and third, we should also remember, as well as protecting children from abuse due to this crass idiocy, we must and will, of course, protect those kids who are clearly trans, as per a medical decision by competent medical and psychological experts and made on a case-by-case -case basis, as there are instances where this is, is potentially the correct and proper things to do. And it's not us that make these decisions. It's the, the properly qualified medical decisions. I know of some children like this. They're, they're rare, and that's the problem. That is the problem. This legislation's got some legitimacy for enabling this to be used, but there was nothing wrong with... But the, the, the people making the decision shouldn't be these idiots. It has to be professionals who know about this, and we should be very, very careful to exclude the power of the lobbyists and the big pharma from enforcing this. So we need to enforce the discretion of professionals and make sure there's absolutely no way the big farmer get their clothes into them on this. But no, it, it, this decision must not be made politically by these people, but rather the proper medically trained experts. And no half-witted tit should presume to dictate laws to direct competent professionals in, in contradicting the science and in direct contradiction to the whole point, which is that the highly trained expert medical professional uses their discretion. But no, these halfwits actually believe they know better. Stupid little people. And Neil Gray is lying. Remove them all. Get rid of these cock wombles. And any moron who thinks this political, this is a political problem is an imbecile. It should be... It is, I mean, it, it, it is, it's not a problem that should be addressed politically. It's medical professionals that should address this. But issue. surely, I mean, but it's politically it has been addressed. That's the point, Phil. So yeah, that's the whole point. I know they should... They've got no business interfering in this. They should stay out of stuff they know little or nothing about. Yeah, the, the other thing is, uh, <laughs> uh, funnily enough, Lloyd, this week, um, it was announced that the due to the hate crime bill, the police are absolutely swamped. And we know that the hate crime bill was brought in to support the GRRB bill. That's really why that was the point of it. Should they now, after the cash report, get rid of the hate crime bill and get rid of the GRRB? Yes, of course. That's, you know, the, the two things are so incredibly interlinked that you can't have one without the other. And if one, namely the GRRB, is no longer uh, law, then the hate crime bill has to be removed as well because they, they, they were supportive of each other. But what, what I find incredible is today I saw an interview with the Justice Minister, Angela Constance, who stated that the fact that the police have been swamped with uh, reports of hate crime 
is the proof of the requirement for this legislation. I have never heard anything so empty headed, well, from a She's Scottish a minister for at least three or four days. But this is beyond understanding. A minister has said that they created a law and then, you know, they told us that we, we were living in a country that's swamped by a rising tide of hatred and that the proof of the efficacy of this law is the fact that there have been hundreds and hundreds of reports by people, most of which have been rejected entirely by the police. Yeah. Now, how Angela Constance comes to the conclusion that she's just created efficacious legislation is utterly and completely beyond my understanding. But then I remember what she used to do for a job. She worked at the uh, state uh, secure hospital at Carstairs. Maybe she should go back there. <laughs> not a man. Um, well, this has gone on as well, the hate crime been swamped. You know, one of the good people in the, the SNP, Joanna Cherry, Eva, he um, opened a salt, actually, if you like, opened a, fired a, a shot across Humza's uh, bow. She said the, the voters are sick of Humza's virtue signalling. Is this is that true, or is this maybe... Is this some manoeuvring going on, um, some stalking? Well, it might be a bit of both. Um, what I know that Joanna was very concerned about was what Lloyd was just talking about there, the numbers, the reports that there were. There were over 7,000 hate complaints recorded in the first week. 7,000. Out of that, 240 are described by the police as being hate crimes. That must be their prima facie description on the surface because there's no way they've investigated, recorded, prosecuted, convicted 240 hate criminals in a week. That hasn't happened. These are records of complaints. They are not actually proven crimes. Interestingly, though, out of the 7,000, 30 non-crime hate incidents were recorded. So that's a total of 270 considered valid out of 7,000. Now, this goes against the legislation and the police guidance because the police said every single event that was described as a hate crime was going to be investigated. And they also said they would all be recorded because the problem was not the intention necessarily of the perpetrator. The issue was the subjective view of the alleged target or victim of the hate crime. So given that there were 7,000 reports, there should be 7,000 incidents recorded of either crime or non-crime. So it is complete and utter disarray, and it is one of the reasons why people are really seriously hacked off, as Joanna Cherry rightly says, with Hamza and all those hanging on his coattails. Because this is just another feature of dogmatism on the part of politicians who are not the brightest, not the cleverest, and ought not to be in power and in control if that's what it is. The people who elected the SNP, either in Holyrood or in Westminster, did so principally because they wanted to see independence and they wanted to see a proper concerted drive towards that where there were policies that were competent and the overriding factor was we're making Scotland a better place because we're people who listen to the population, we know what they want and we know how to deliver it. Instead, what you've got is this trio of GRR, hate crime, and prior to that, changing the question on the census to bring in the trans question. So we've spent fortunes on that. We've lost literally millions of pounds pursuing all the green policies, all of which are niche, and most of them are not actually desired by the majority of the electorate. The majority of Scotland, we know, well over 50% want independence. What they don't want is Hamza on the telly talking about how Scotland's full of hate when Scotland is not full of hate. But it's what we hear every day. You would think, listening to him and to others around him, that Scotland was a hotbed of constant war and factions and constant criminal activity. It isn't. However, 
the number of people in prisons remains too high. The number of people in probation isn't as high as it should be. But the number of people that are leaving school with too few qualifications is still too low. And the number of folk that are skint and suffering as the result of fuel crisis and cost of living crisis is becoming exponential because the government has no clue what it's doing other than to say, come the general election, vote SNP, and then we'll go into coalition with Labour, and then we'll get a section 30, and then we can vote for independence. If you believe that, I'll sell you a bridge. Yeah, and I'll throw in some Mexican beans, and you, you can climb up great. <laughs> Getting, pardon me. Uh, but the thing is, Phil, there's a great... Um, a great blog today, actually, by Sally Sally Hughes, uh, a fellow independence for independence in Perth and Um She wrote a great one. She's ex police like yourself, and she talked about the time it took to take one of these false reports. She had, she gave an example of a wife who was making false allegations that turned out about her husband. Um, but it takes forever. Now, if you've got seven thousand, how much time does that take? Yeah, it's absolutely absurd. It's um, it's nonsense. It's the biggest problem is all domestic. So she used the right example. Domestics is what most police fear, and since this hate crime is based in the home, it's just it's recipe for disaster. It really is. It's absolute nonsense. Thought and then come and combine it with thought police. It's just horrific. So no, it's it's completely impractical, and hopefully it falls in its arse sooner rather than later. With Joanna saying uh, what she said about the voters in your question. As much as I respect Joanna and rate her, she has made big mistakes. Fighting the democratically valid decision of the UK, like it or lump it, primarily the English, to take the UK out of the EU. Aye, so much for your mantra, Ian Blackford. Instead of taking advantage of this massive mistake as Napoleon, as any strategist would do, don't disrupt your many enemy when making a mistake. What do we do? What did Nicola get Joanna do, to do and why did Joanna not caught on, not figure out that this was deflection? Why did she not say no, let's not fight their battles, they're losing, this is a war they're going to lose. Why instead are we not seizing the day and fighting for independence? And her, she let her ego get the better of her. Joanna, I'm sorry, but she's a lawyer. There's a, there was a big bit of the big I am about it because and, and cause she, in fairness she does a great job she knows her shit uh, she's a really professional person but she's a human and she has been distracted and she's no saint and she's not that easy to deal with because she's a lawyer no no offence Eva but you know what I mean <laughs> and anyway reversing Brexit wasn't your job Joanna you know that wasn't your job. She does a great job, but that wasn't your job. Freeing the people of Scotland from its chains is. So you failed like the rest of the SNP. So let's have the plaudits for Joanna. Let's get back into reality here. And Kate, if it is stalking horse for Kate, Kate's not a change in direction from Nicola and Humza. Kate is just, I would say, a slightly less bitter pill than the, the, the two predecessing clowns because it's going to be Kate next um, look at her in, in, in initiating her ongoing support for the corruption the corruption that is free ports someone like Ash Reagan would have been, a, would have been ideal or, and, and in Scotland we have many who could lead we, we are a resourceful and successful people after all you know the 8.3% we exceed in every market we enter we exceed in every profession we enter so long as we're doing better than 8% of the, the, uh, then then we're, we're we're punching above our weight in the UK but let's face it it's no competition it's time we went out into the, the bigger world and put put ourselves against something a wee bit more formidable although in fairness they are kicking our ass right now with the corruption and the uh, the, the way they've infested the SNP and the Greens. No, well, um, I just would say on Free Ports midweek, folks, we're having a Free port special. But Lloyd, I'm, I, I'll, I haven't sent you the invite yet, but if you're, I know you watch this show. I will be sending you an invite. I'll finish you on Wednesday as well. And, and Europe, Powell, David Powell, who's a bit of an expert in that, so we'll be doing that on Wednesday, but that's another story for another day. Meanwhile, um, on the sort of hate crime thing, there was a lot of complaints we know went in, um, and I think a lot of them were tongue in the cheek, Lloyd, about Humza and his ridiculous speech he made quite some time ago, 
about there's too many white people in Scotland. Um, is Techie going to stick that up? Um, Holmes is like latest be outburst. Everyone who reported my white speech is far right. I mean, it's true, he is digging himself another big hole. It, just, you know, sometimes you just got to learn to shut it the mouth, don't you think, Lloyd? Yeah. I think the biggest problem we have at the moment is Hamza Yusuf has no real understanding of the nature of the job that he has. He is the first minister of our country. For him to take every every minor slight as some kind of personal attack shows the weakness of him as an individual. This is not a man who should be in charge of a pedestrian crossing, never mind a country. It's, it, 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 we're in, we're in a sad, sad situation, but I think that sad, sad situation is going to change. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll restate what I've stated a couple of times. I don't believe that Hamza Yusuf will come back from his maternity leave. And I think that would be a bonus for the country. But whoever replaces him has to be someone who understands the nature of the sovereignty of the people of this country and the desires and wishes of the people of this country. And uh, unfortunately, to my mind, given how much she rolled over on the issue of free ports, I think Kate Forbes has effectively told the world that she has no real understanding of the nature of the independence movement. She has little or no understanding of the nature of sovereignty. And of course, combine that with her member of the membership of the British American Partnership, then I would suggest that Kate Forbes is not the future for an independent Scotland. She would be the future for a constantly devolved Scotland. Mm, yeah, yeah, I agree wholeheartedly, everything you said there. Um, but the other thing is, suddenly this week, um, Eva, over and above whom are putting his foot in it, he was telling all his voters, you know, they should not, in, they, they should not vote for the Greens. There we go. It's a vote wasted. And the Greens were saying, tell voters to reject the SNP. Is at last the penny dropping with Humza and the SNP that the Greens are toxic and have dragged them down? Because I'm about to come on in a minute to one of their other latest policies, which is doomed to fail. Um, but is, is Humza wakening up, Eva? No. Oh. No, this is what you call party before country yet again. Remember, the Greens are supposed to have independence as a red line and then they confess they did not. But the Greens are meant to be in coalition with the SNP in Holyrood because they were supposedly an independence supporting party. So if the SNP want independence at the general election and if the Greens wanted independence at the general election, then you would have a Scotland United campaign. Instead, what will happen is the SNP, the Greens, probably ALBA, maybe the ISP, perhaps some of the independents for independent candidates will all end up fighting each other and the unionists will be yeah. laughing all the way to the bank once more. So this is just petty playground politicking from teenagers actually who've never really grown up. They seem to neither understand nor care about what it is the people of Scotland need. The last thing the folk of Scotland need is to see headlines like this, where it's just, you know, on a daily basis, yeah, boo, sucks. We think you're rubbish. Well, we think you're rubbish as well, but you'll be our pals at the moment to enable us to retain power in Scotland and to have a couple of Greens, wholly unsuited for the purpose, sitting in the Scottish Cabinet, raking it in while absolutely squandering millions of pounds regularly on madcap policies that are badly thought out and badly implemented. The deposit return scheme probably being the most notorious, but we're obviously heading down that direction with various other matters, including this wood burning stove carry on that you're coming on to. So that that rather than than us continue to take flack for criticizing politicians I like when we give them some constructive ideas. And the most constructive thing that the SNP or the Greens can do at the moment is to review how many candidates they're standing at the general election and what they're actually standing for. Because the Greens ought not to be standing for power for themselves, nor should the SNP. They should be standing as part of a coalition for independence because we know that's what the people of Scotland want. Mm -hmm. If they want 
continue to fracture the movement, carry on doing what they're doing, but there will be a day of reckoning because whether it's at this general election or at the next Holyrood election, the people will have their revenge on those who continue to sell them out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Phil, he was touched on it, you know, the, the, this week, the, the whole carry on about the wood burning stoves, the, the new builds, you can't have them. And definitely, you know, this is from the Greens are all urbanists from in the round Edinburgh, the west end of Glasgow. <clears throat> you know, people up north, it's Andy Whiteman, uh, who's a proper Green, a real, what I'd call a real Green. Proper. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, put it out, you know, that, that this is one, it's, it, it's good for up there, it's probably the only form of hate that can be sometimes used. I mean, again, it's just a policy. Does anyone think these policies through? No, no, they're, they're carrying out the policies that are dictated to them by those who, again, would keep us on our knees. So, I mean, uh, your, your first question, uh, the SNP Greens, is this is, is this uh, a divorce pending? Frankly, I'm past caring for these bozos. The fact that we, the Scottish people, should be paying attention to is that neither of these shyster parties are pursuing Scottish independence and explicitly are avoiding unification. No pennies are dropping with these knobheads. They are not thinking the way we think. If you, if you feel that you want independence, you will act in a certain way. Just look at the actions, not the words as I've said time and time again. This is well known that this uh, the, the game that they're playing it's just a way of staying in power and jostling for position and trying to maximize their vote in a time tested and tried method eva's correct it's amateur and more in fact than that it's 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 incompetence from bozos who are completely out of depth and currently in jobs that they're being overpaid for and they have no chance in earning these salaries in the real world i, I would hire i wouldn't hire any of these bozos as my assistant's assistant it's just a waste of time on the 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 wood burning stove ban Lots of reports on it and lots of misinformation scooting about. I mean, the Herald's got a quite an accurate one. It's the BBC. Check it out. Even, I mean, I, I checked out a few sources. But yeah, you're right, Roddy. Islanders, rural communities, architects specialise in off-the-grid homes. And this is coming from the Herald. I'm paraphrasing from the Herald um, article recently. After the Scottish Government quietly introduced a ban on wood burning stoves. So... You know, it's an anti-carbon measure to block installing much-needed backup heat sources, especially, you know, when there's power-related cut uh, power cuts coming along. But um, ministers are saying this is vital towards a, a, a net zero or zero emission future. They have no idea. These are unqualified people who are repeating mantras and... Virtue signalling, so back to Joanna, she's right, this is more virtue, virtue signalling. They don't even know what it means. They don't, net zero has a definition, but it's impossible. It's utter nonsense. Unless you want to move into the woods and burn wood. <laughs> it's like, it's just, it's honestly crazy. And and, and the, the new laws, what, what, what's actually been banned? Well, it's keen to move away from carbon emitting heat source. So all new built properties from April the 1st, yeah, April Fools, are prohibited from installing systems that rely on fossil or biofuels. This means gas boilers, wood burning, which is the cheapest form of heating right now, critically. You're, you're taking away the cheapest form of heating in a country where there is fuel poverty. And you're supposed to represent the people you... What? You know? Um, so... It, it's, 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 they've got design, design around the ten, alternative heating sources such as ground pump, heat networks and electric heat, electric heaters, electric heaters, really. You want to force people in the schemes to fit electric heaters or new schemes to... It's Most of this is more expensive. Natural gas and oil, which we have in Scotland in plentiful supply, should be, and even the prices you're paying now should be a fraction of what we in Scotland are being charged. I'd say about a third. Of the current price would be the mark that if I were Minister of Energy in an independent Scotland and oil and gas sales abroad, to, mostly to England, would be uh, covering for that. That would be, that would be covering for it. Oh, I hundred percent. And and the, it's a case by case basis. We we, we would we, we think um, there is discrepancy. See, they can, if, if the need can be justified, you can get exemption from this. But uh, this is the work of idiots, the same ideological twats that have little or no real life experience, no understanding of the science, 
whether it be biology, energy, physics, and, and remove these clowns at the first opportunity, Scotland. Anyone who does not realise that burning wood is the way forward. I mean, it's, it's renewable. We just grow more. It's sustainable. We manage the forestry and inexpensive, especially for those who have access to the forest. So anyone near any of the any of the country sites, this is something we can provide very cheaply in Scotland. Plenty of space and CO two CO two again, folks, is actually a fertilizer. Plants thrive in high CO two concentrations. That's why greenhouse owners direct heating fumes. CO2 back into the greenhouse to increase shield and more than that around 145 or 160 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere the plants start to die that would wipe out life on earth and just before the industrial revolution it was down just above 200 200 and something the records are showing 230 or something if it would have went down another 100 we wouldn't be here so, yeah. I mean, they've got no idea what they're talking about. Anyway, and, and if you want to understand more about it, look at the Milankovic cycle. For one, part, the cloud play the biggest, clouds play the, or water vapour play the biggest part in global warming, but 90 to 95% of the influence. Well, you These people have got no idea. What you, you said, what you would do if you were the Minister of, if I was the Minister of Transport, there would be barhead people, motorway lanes, wouldn't there? <laughs> Uh, Why not? Yeah. It's good well, to be I, king. I, I saw, I saw um, some graph that someone put up, and I, kept, I meant to grab it and I forgot, um, which showed the emissions of, of CO2. In Scotland, something like 0 0.09 of the global. You know, like China's 31%, the United States is 15%. Scotland's 0 0.90. Lloyd, how much more do they want us to get rid of for it? 0 0.90. <laughs> You know, Phil kind of summed it up there. What we're dealing with here are, are people who are not, who are ideologically driven, but they haven't even gone to the, the effort of looking at what their ideology actually is and whether it stands up to any level of scrutiny. They've bought a whole set of slogans and the slogans have become policy in the same way as, you know, trans rights or human rights, uh, you know, anyone but anyone in the Scottish Green Party at the moment, who genuinely believes in the, 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 the proper management of the ecology of our country is being silenced. And they're being silenced by the, the zealots at the top of the party. I mean, I find it shocking watching their conference last week, the maximum number of people, now remembering that this is, this is, this is a party that is in coalition government in our country there were 62 people in attendance at their conference. Now, six of them are members of parliament. Another 20 or so are the staff of those six members of parliament. So what exactly is the membership of the Scottish Green Party? And here's another conundrum. How is it that a party who can get less than 100 people at their conference is preparing to stand in at least half of the seats in the country. You mean, where, where does the Green Party's money come from? Because certainly in my constituency, the constituency I live in rather, the Green Party are three people. And that's one of the major constituencies in Edinburgh. When the Edinburgh Greens get together, you're talking about 20 people. Where does their finance come from? We know that their ideology comes from fortune cookies, but, uh, you know, where does their finance come from? That's what I want to know, because other parties of similar size, for instance, the Scottish Socialist Party, which actually has more members in Scotland than the Green Party, it can barely stand in one or two seats. So what's, what, what, what is it about the Scottish Green Party? Who is the benefactor? Is the benefactor maybe those uh, offshore investment funds that Lorna Slater, the circularity minister, just did a deal with to reforest our country. How come we require, through a green minister, you know, a progressive, as they're commonly known in our current politics, is going to offshore funds, which are money laundering operations, to reforest our country? But then again, how much does Lana Slater know about this country? You know how long she'd been here? I'm, I'm, I'm astounded, absolutely astounded by 
the number of people in the Scottish Green Party who have an, no appreciation whatsoever of either the history, the ecology, or the culture of the country where they wish to be legislators, parts of the government. It's time to get rid of this law. And the big problem we've got is green is a slogan. It means nothing. It's empty. Remember what happened to the Green Party in Germany when they suddenly discovered that their entire leadership were actually in the pocket of NATO and that same <laughs> Green Party that now is the only Green Party in, in Europe that's advocating for nuclear power. Now, what is this green movement? What's green about it? I see nothing but manipulation from the outside. That's all I see, particularly in the Scottish Green Party. Yeah. And there you go, folks. Lloyd watched the Greens conference through. You didn't need to. You should be grateful. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind that to you, sir. You really need to get out more, Lloyd. I mean, that, that's taking duty to a new level. To a new level. Um, on Eva, something that's really important this week, um, we've got a, can I just say that a, our, our techie who, who knows things, folks, techie knows things that we don't know. He's just told me in the, the comments here that rotting wood actually emits the same amount of CO2 as burned wood, but just over a longer time. So this wood that you don't burn will rot and therefore give you more CO2 emissions. I think that's what the techie's telling us. Just berserk, berserk. Um, uh, quickly moving on, there was a uh, opinion polls out this week, Eva, and uh, the great thing about it again was that independence is in the majority. Techie, did, I can't remember. Techie, do we have something on the... the there you go, thanks very much. It gives us a two-point lead, but what it also shows, Eva, is that the SNP are down to 31%. And the uh, Alpa are at one two percent. They got three percent in a uh, uh, last this week in a uh, a by election up in Inverness. Um, but if you look at these numbers, it shows again that there's twenty odd percent of people who support independence who are not going to go to the polling station this year unless they get someone an independent or maybe a not my parliament to vote for. This and earlier comments lead me to, to reminisce on something which you might think is, is a bit odd um, when I explain this. Um, I have covered practically every inch of Scotland in my life on holidays and weekend trips and what have you since I was a wee girl. Um, the only parts of Scotland that I don't know at all and I've never visited but I will one day are Orkney and Shetland. But I noticed when I was learning to read that in practically every gift shop, whether it was, you know, John O'Groats or down in Gretna, you saw that dish towel that referred to God zooming about on his cloud, blethering away to the Archangel Gabriel and explaining to him about what he planned for Scotland. And he's talking to him about, you know, the majestic mountains and the, the lochs and the water and the whiskey and the, you know, the fields of wheat and all this sort of stuff. And Gabriel says, well, you know, think you're being a wee bit too good to these Scots, God. And the big man says, well, Gabriel, as you know, wait until you see the neighbours I'm giving them. But God was only partly right because the biggest problem with Scotland is the Scots. Correct. Because they lack imagination. Yeah. And the imagination that is required and the vision that's required is what I'm listening to from Lloyd and from yourself, and from Phil, and from so many other people that I know in the independence movement. We can see very easily what needs to happen in our country, and we can see it unfold in front of us. We need not to be governed by incompetent fools. We need the people to understand that they have the power to transform this country. When you speak of, for example, forestry, why is it that we've got a housing problem, a homeless problem, but we've got forests? across the country. Mm -hmm. Why are we not building houses with wood? Why do we not have wood burning stoves in as many homes as possible? The reason that we don't is we've got politicians who don't look at it like that. They can't see in front of their own noses. They can't see the big picture because they're either unable or unwilling to see it. We have politicians who refer to hate, as we said earlier on, the problem in Scotland isn't hatred. 
The problems in Scotland are to do with poverty, lack of hope, lack of decent education, lack of ability for people to bring themselves out of the doldrums, whether that's because they were born into poverty or because they've become poverty stricken as the result of poor life chances or difficulties that have been traumatic in some way. And that's where society and community and responsible government comes in. There is no reason for Scotland to be poor or to be unequal, except for a lack of political will and a lack of political leadership. So I would say that the way that we galvanise the independence movement is to stand a good, strong, visionary candidate in as many seats as possible. If you've got an SNP or a Green or an ISP or an ALBA candidate that you believe is devoted to Scotland's cause and who will fight tooth and nail to deliver independence, then you give that candidate your every support. But if you don't have that kind of candidate in your seat, you consider whether it's your turn to stand up and be counted. You know, we talk about for as long as 100 of us shall remain alive. We don't need 100. We need 29 independent candidates, whether they're SNP, ALBA, ISP or Independence for Independent. 29 of them win at the general election. We win. Scotland wins a majority of seats. We win a majority of the popular vote and we're chapping on the door to negotiate the terms of independence with whoever becomes the Prime Minister of the last Parliament of the United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. I've done, I've done it again. You've got me. The, the claimers coming out. The fact came up. The claimers coming out. Full. 53 for independence, 31 for the SNP, 2 for Alpha. What are we going to do with the 20? What's your plan? What do you do about people that are disenfranchised and that have been betrayed? Well, you need to fix, you need to correct, you need to regain control and take possession of your own future again, which means the vehicles are the political parties and they're damn hard to manage. Very, very difficult to run a political party or a pseudo-political party or anything that involves people. The cat herding analogy is correct because people were all different and we're all if it's the only problem the biggest problem with people is we've got two ears and one mouth and we don't use them proportionally that is the biggest single problem on this subject i'd say eve has nailed it so i'll say little on this but i would say select candidate by candidate you know i, I by the valid by the, the the integrity or the person that you believe them to be though i would remove as many SNP as possible here because the bigger the train crash the more damage is done to grifters and those in the pockets of the establishment. I think only a massive train crash will wake up the remainder of SNP pro-independent supporters to the fact that they have been betrayed by the SNP leadership since Nicola took over and the various carpet baggers that have grifted in those tumbleweed that have infested Scotland. So whether there's an Indy First candidate, Alaba, ISP, or independent supporter of independence, then get get them, in fact, get all of them on your ballot. But no SNP, no Labour, and if you've got no choice, then spoil your ballot with a narrative, not my parliament. And it won't be counted. But what it will show is a, is a lower, it will, it, will sh it will show a massive increase in the number of spoiled ballots. And that is something that we can uh, we can make a point on. Um, back, are we touched, did you, are, we, are we going to talk about Humza's interview about the, the he's too many whites thing and they're digging the hole? Or can go yeah, I saw that, but I didn't get a chance to, to speak much on it. So I would, I would point out in that, if that is exactly what he said, Humza, because he said, I believe, that in an interview that anyone upset by his too many whites in Scotland speech is a far right racist. Fair comment or absolute mince, you asked Roddy. Well, if that's exactly what he said, then he's talking out his arse. This is Scotland. The indigenous peoples exist on the frozen edge of Northern Europe. Of course, we are pale in skin colour. It's called evolution, or is this just more science denial? Humza, you tit. 
is it? It should, be, it, should, it should be more concerned about non-Scots who are running all our institutions like the, the National the English, Museum or, and the National Library all of this and type the, of stuff the Ballet and, and the Opera and, and if they're doing it, institutions. if they're doing it objectively fine because of the best people and we but we're not making these appointments and we're not making these decisions these institutions are corrupted and more serious ones the judiciary um anyway we'll come on another time but scotland's people is a large majority of indigenous white people who, who build who built a relatively civilized society that people from less civilized societies clamber to enter and I mean that, but I've travelled extensively in the world, and there's places where you'll get a door kicked in and executed if you complain. Should we, the local indigenous, move aside and give someone a job because of the colour of their skin? No. I mean, that, that, that that's just racism. What, what we want, we abhor hate ra racism. Fuck right, oh, excuse me. But do you know what I mean? We all feel the same way. Ra there's no place in a civilised society for racism. Fuck it. You know? We, we, well, we will not tolerate it. This is who we are. We will not have any of that crap here, you know. So, I dare you to come out with the kind of piss you come out with then, Humza, you clown. And you get lifted for it now with a stupid law in place. I mean, I believe in freedom of speech, but we should know where these racists are. We should be able to find them. And we should, don't let them go underground and we should expose them for what they are, you know. Because we know how to deal with these people. This, I mean, this daft law is making an ass of the law. And we, the people, need to change it. Just like the stupid wood fire and oil gas boiler law, the offensive behaviour and the football act. The list goes on. Humza, you're a clown. Indeed. Um, Lloyd, the 20%, what do we do? The 20%. The 20% is only going to grow. The only way to get them back is for there to be a campaign which is about independence. Yeah. And that's not what's on offer from the Scottish National Party. It's not what's on offer from the Green Party. At the yeah. coming general election, if you have the opportunity to vote for someone, as Eva said, who is commitment, committed to a vision of our, our country, free and a member of the United Nations, then vote for them. But if you don't, then I would suggest you take Alan Petrie's advice and go to the polling station. Don't stay at home. Go to the polling station and mark your paper, not my parliament. And the not my parliament statement is, I want my own parliament. I want an independent Scottish parliament. And that is a, a positive democratic act if you can't vote for any of the candidates on the ballot paper. That would be what I would urge. But in real terms, to get those 20% of people reinvigorated, re-engaged, that's going to require a real campaign for independence in a party or a group or individuals who are prepared to go on the Scotland United line. And I mean, I would say right now, one of the things that the SNP, the Alapa Party, the ISP and a number of others could do to state their Scotland United credentials would be to make the sensible decision, allow a native of the constituency of Alloa and Grangemouth to stand as a Scotland United with the full support of the SNP, the Alapa Party and ISP. Make that, do that, do the sensible thing. Say you won't stand and let Eva have a free run against that seat because it is the microcosm of what Scotland faces in the future. The free port and the closure of Grangemouth, the crushing of our economy, the last vestiges of our industry, of our industry removed. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. Leave it. Leave it to a native of the area to fight this seat on behalf of us all for the cause of independence and not for the cause of party. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Of course, I would agree. The other thing I just did this week there was a, a by election up in Inverness where the turnout was only 28%, which just is indicative of our politics, but it was won by an independent. There you go. Another independent wins. Either um, our, our uh, Scottish block grant, Techie, can you stick up that picture there? It just, it's, you can take, take more of it. If you actually look down it, the Scottish block grant now is down to 3.5% of the total expenditure of the United Kingdom. 
Um, it's the lowest it's ever been. Now, if it was adjusted in a good old UK, shouldn't we be getting 8.9% if you wanted to, to get uh, it to some equity in it? Of course we should. They're reducing it all the, year, all the time. Well, obviously it's easy to blame Westminster for this and to point out that it's not fair. But nothing in life is fair. It's not meant to be fair. There's no any point in whinging and whining about it. The reason why we're thrilled to Westminster is because the politicians elected to achieve our independence well, have signally failed to do that. And it's their fault that you look right around Scotland and you see from irritations like potholes in every road to horribly huge homeless statistics, low numbers, far too low numbers of house building, shortages of teachers, madcap policies where teachers who have just qualified work for a year and then they're on the dole and teachers who've been longer qualified can not get work because it's cheaper for the councils to employ newly qualified because their wages are covered by central government or you've got instances where for example teachers are buying school equipment because the school budget doesn't run to it you've got sets of circumstances where charities are actually running out of food within food banks because the people who used to donate are not so able so to do. We have on every high street in every village, town and city a number of charity shops, bookies and takeaways because we're not a country who tends to produce the way that we used to. We're relying on service industries and charitable events and all of this boils down to the fact that the Scottish people are badly served by the governments currently elected in Holyrood and those elected to represent us in Westminster. Any Scottish politician who says that voting for them to go to Westminster to make Scotland's voice heard might as well be shouting up my chimney because there is no point in being in Westminster to make Scotland's voice heard if you're not there while majority negotiating the terms of independence. So those politicians who say this time round, trust me with your vote, trust my party with your vote, and we will make Scotland heard. We will hold Rishi Sunak's feet to the fire. We will hold Keir Starmer's feet to the fire. So what? That butters no parsnips, it feeds no hungry wains, it heats no cold pensioners, it pays not the level of pension that Scots pensioners ought to have. So the answer for every Scot who thinks seriously about budgets and the money that governments need to run the country properly, who might be on a hospital waiting list, who might be on a trolley in accident and emergency waiting a couple of hours too long, or who <laughs> might be not even on a bed or on a trolley, but sitting in a chair in a waiting room for hours on end or no getting an MRI scan on time, no getting their cancer treatment on time. All of these people need to think carefully about what government does and what government could and should do. Were we independent, wringing our own till, spending our own money from the harvest that we reap by ourselves, for ourselves? That is what we need to do this year because otherwise the future for Scotland is incredibly bleak and nobody deserves that. Here, here. Um, so we're running out of time. We've got a couple of topics I want to get in. Moving on from that one, if I may, is uh, Teki, could you stick up um, the, the tweet I, should, I played earlier? I couldn't get the line. It's from West Streeting. He used his son to claim that middle class lefties who oppose his push for privatisation of the NHS, um, you know, he, he's trying to say he's a fighter for the working class and it's only middle class lefties who oppose the privatisation. Um, I would say he's probably the bloody middle class lefty uh, and not a socialist. But uh, how can a Labour Party want to privatise more of our uh, NHS? Well, this this is appalling. This this is because it's not the Labour Party. It's certainly not the Labour Party that we grew up. It's not the Labour Party of all the greats of the Labour Party or or, or of Corbyn. It's not um, the ragged trousered philanthropist Tressel's Labour Party. This is um, the Labour Shadow Health Secretary promoting promoting privatisation in the NHS. 
I mean, my God, really? The Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeton, he said that he wants the NHS to lean on the private health sector in the short term so it can drastically reduce its dependence in the future, as he rejected New Labour's ideological conviction that competition drives up standards. I mean, defending what he described as his unfashionably nuanced perspectives. Streeton said in an interview in the Financial Times, and I'm quoting the Financial Times, I can simultaneously want to reduce NHS reliance on the private sector by making sure it has the staff and equipment, the technology it needs to treat patients on time, at the same time as recognising that there is currently some capacity in the private sector that we should seek to use. So, what you're saying there, Wes, you're saying you can you can simultaneously want to reduce reliance on the private sector by using the private sector? Shut it, you clown. What a... Jesus God. I mean, the thing this is, guy's... most of these, when they bring in agency nurses, these are usually NHS nurses. They're more expensive, are... and they're much, I, I, much yeah, more expensive. They're moonlighting moon because they're not getting paid a decent wage or having Which elsewhere, I know, it's, it's appalling. It's absolutely appalling. This guy, awesome. this guy's jockeying for position as the, the future, either Labour leader or certainly the Minister for Health when Labour win this next election. Yeah. I mean, he, he was one of the central architects in the health policy under Tony Blair, right? And, um, you know, with, with, with Alan Milburn, the, the advisor was at Paul Corrigan, and I, this is again. I'm getting this Financial Times. Um, they rolled up the sleeves to help the pre- team to prepare in a serious way for government. I by selling us out. That is not Labour. That is not the party that I. This is Tony Blair's Labour, under Keir Starmer, which is one and the same. This is not socialism. Oh no, I, I don't. I don't do that. I don't. I don't subscribe to that philosophy. So go fuck. Oh, sorry. Uh, so just jog on, Mister Starmer. I know. Oh, I just you get sick of this pish. You know, it's just it's incessant pish, and you just think, nah. There we go. After the watershed, folks, don't show before then. After the watershed, uh, there you go. Uh, uh, the last, the last item I want to cover. Take is stick up my. Favourite picture of the week. There oh. we Lloyd, there we go. It's Tartan Day. And there we go. All these anti-Scottish, pro-English nationalists, Scots-born English nationalists, donning their kilt. And whoosh, whoosh, whooshing it. Okay, they do. Um, they should be made to pay for their own junket. And they're that wisher right at the front. Another one whose best pals are all Tories. Ball um, bags. It should. Uh, it's just quite disgusting to see those people there who do everything in their power from the minute they wake up till they close their eyes to stop their country of birth progressing. Aye, shortbread tin patriots. I think someone exactly. described them as. Oh, what can I say? I was hoping you were going to show us the the shortbread version of the Empire State Building, which is you know one of the the great creations of Scotland the past year, so much so that we had to transport it across the Atlantic to show it off to our American cousins. What have we become? What have we become? Are we fucking Disneyland? You know, that's a... The, 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 uh, what can you say? We've got a bunch of people who climbed on an aeroplane to go to somewhere where they feel impressed that they feel important because America has asked them to come over, as if it's paying some kind of, you know, what be- what benefit do we get from this? Genuinely. I'd love to see Audit Scotland do an audit of Tartan Day and its achievements since its, since its formation back in the early 2000s. That's not to say that we shouldn't have an excellent relationship with America, but we need to have a relationship with America that's with its people and not with its structures. We've got plenty of them already cruising about in our <coughs> land and in our ear. Like, what can you say? You know, I mean, for God's sake, you know, the only the only benefit was that Angus Robertson wasn't in the picture. Yeah, he was going to be taking the picture. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, oh, no, uh, Eva's got something to say before she goes. There you go, Eva. Okay, thanks, Roddy. I just want to point out, although I'm sure all the viewers know this already, that Tartan Day or Tartan Week arises because of the anniversary of the Declaration of Fire Growth being 6th of April in the year 1320. And the point of the Declaration of Fire Growth was to speak about the rights and the liberty and the happiness of the ordinary common people of Scotland and how they were entitled to look to their monarch, their king, to look after them 
And if their monarch let them down, they could kick his arse and replace him because that was democracy. I would like to think that in a really progressive independent Scotland, the 6th of April, Tartan Day, which will be celebrated at home in Scotland by Scottish politicians, will involve invitations to American politicians to come to Scotland because Scots politicians will want to and be expected and required to spend the day at home in Scotland with their own folk and show the benefits of Scotland to the world from Scotland. Well said, Eva. Well said. Absolutely. Absolutely, folks. There we have it. Thanks for joining it. My light has been terrible tonight. I don't know what the heck's happened, but it's not working or something. Um, I hope you and yours are well. I hope you've enjoyed this show. And until we see you, please, please take care. Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy.